Good afternoon. I'm Mark Maurer. Delighted to be here to talk about these issues. Um, I, I want to try to frame the, the question somewhat as thinking about the uh, how we formulate criminal justice policy and basically what the sort of racial assumptions, the racial dynamics are of the policy in general. And let me begin by telling a, a story uh, about a friend of mine. Um, my friend, who happens to be white and middle class, uh, he and his wife have three teenage kids, two girls and a boy. And a couple of years ago, their teenage son started acting like a teenage son. So he was staying out late at night. He was smashing up the family car once in a while. His grades were going down. There may have been some drinking or drug use going on. Nothing terrible, but they were beginning to get concerned. And one night, they get a call from the local police who say that their son just been picked up for shoplifting from the local 7-Eleven store, and they can come down to the police station and pick him up. And over the course of the next two weeks, my friend's wife um, engaged in discussions, negotiations, first with the police, then with the prosecutor assigned to the case. And they basically said, you know, our son has been having problems. We know that. He knows that. Uh, we've identified a social worker who we think can help him through this time. He's amenable to working with the social worker. We think we can work these things out. And the prosecutor basically said, well, you know, that sounds good to me. You know, this is his first shoplifting arrest. Uh, it sounds like you've got a plan. You've got family support. So, yes, that sounds fine. Why don't we drop the charges and why don't you go ahead and do that? So the kid goes along and sees a social worker over a period of time. And, indeed, she is very helpful in helping him figure out what he's doing, where he wants to go. And, ultimately, you know, graduates from high school, goes off to college and looks like he's going to have himself a nice middle-class career, whatever that might look like. Now, on the same night that my friend's son was arrested, I would imagine not very far away, there was another kid arrested for the same crime, uh, gets picked up by the police. Uh, only his parents may not have had the negotiating skills or the resources to bring a private social worker into the equation to talk about the prosecutor about alternatives. Now, he's not going to go to prison on his first shoplifting uh, charge. He's going to, you know, get uh, convicted of a misdemeanor or maybe have to do community service or pay a fine, something like that. But six months later, he gets picked up again for larceny or breaking into a car or something like that. And all of a sudden, he starts to look like one of these habitual offenders that we hear about. And he starts to go down a very different path than my friend's son is going down. So it seems to me when we're talking about issues of race and justice, we're also talking about social class. We're talking about the intersection of race and justice. And we can't have these conversations in isolated ways. We want to think in, in some bigger picture terms. Now, the bigger picture, you know, as I think we all know, um, you know, a few years ago, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the historic Brown versus Board of Education decision, 1954. And on the day of the Brown decision, there were about 100,000 African Americans who were incarcerated in prison and jail, 100,000. Since then, we've had half a century of opening up of social and economic opportunity for many pre people for whom that was previously denied. There's clearly great progress been made in society. If we look in the criminal justice system, people of color, often in leadership positions throughout the system, none of this to the degree we would like to see, but clearly progress has been made. Uh, you may have heard we now have a black man as president as well. Lots of things have changed, right? And yet, when we look at the criminal justice system, that figure of 100,000 African Americans behind bars has now gone up to 900,000. So we have a problem here, right? And this is a very complicated problem to try to figure out what's going on here. So, you know, what do we know about this? Well, this morning we had some discussion about the sort of structural and theoretical concepts behind this. And, you know, some people suggesting that mass incarceration is the next stage in American social control following the Jim Crow era. Uh, we also see mass incarceration starting in the 1970s coming at the same time as tremendous economic changes in American society, uh, changes in the U.S. position of leadership in many ways, shifts from a manufacturing society to a finance society, a service economy. And certainly beginning around 1980, uh, a broad division between the rich and the poor. The rich becoming very, very rich and the poor becoming very, very poor. So much greater disparity of wealth. 
And so for the communities left behind, whether that was consciously done or just by neglect or ignorance, uh, life has gotten much harder and the criminal justice system has sort of come along or been available to pick up the pieces, essentially. So that's one part of the story. Um, another part of the story is, you know, looking at the criminal justice system itself and uh, what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. So the Jim Crow era is gone, but uh, race has not disappeared as a factor in decision-making in practice of actors in the criminal justice system. So we see, for example, uh, the level of law enforcement, lots of documentation about racial profiling in the last decade or so, in case there was anybody who was not aware of that already. If we look at um, courtrooms, sentencing, certainly in the death penalty, the, the evidence is the most extreme. Race of victim is probably the most significant factor in determining who receives a death penalty versus a lesser sentence. Um, but if we look at other areas of sentencing, it does get more complicated. Uh, is race a factor? Yes, it's still a factor, but we can't unambiguously say that, you know, a black burglar always gets more time in prison than a white burglar. It's complicated. It depends on race in combination with other factors. In some studies, we find a racial effect and others we don't. So there's no question race plays a role. There's no question that we need to keep uncovering this. Um, but it seems to me that, you know, if we're only looking at some of these day-to-day decision-making uh, uh, moments that we sort of risk looking at missing some of the, the bigger picture uh, of what's going on in the system. And it seems to me that the bigger picture is basically what are the assumptions that we bring about solving social problems, that, you know, every society has a degree of disorder, a degree of crime, degree of public safety problems, uh, but we have a variety of means by which we can choose to address those problems. And so how we choose to address it tells us a lot about what the outcomes are going to be and I think explains why we end up with mass incarceration. And to the extent that we define crime as a black problem, and I think it's undeniable that for a very long time that's how it's been perceived and defined. To the extent we do that, then we define the solution as criminal justice, and when criminal justice doesn't provide a solution, the solution then becomes more criminal justice, and I think that's what we've seen for several decades now. So how is this sort of manifested on a day-to-day -day level? Well, you know, the, the most obvious uh, example, of course, is, is the war on drugs. And this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, you know, we can go back quite a ways if we look at, say, the history of, of marijuana policy in this country. If we go back to the 1930s, uh, the perception of marijuana at the time was that marijuana was a drug that was used in the so-called racy parts of towns. It was used in nightclubs, by African Americans, by Mexican Americans, in seedy parts of town, that sort of thing. Whether or not that was correct, that was a perception, and then we had at the same time, uh, you know, all this uh, reefer madness and marijuana, this demon drug and things like that. Then along comes the 1960s, and millions of young people who look like me started consuming marijuana in great quantities, and all of a sudden, almost overnight, societal attitudes begin to change about marijuana. We have calls for decriminalization, legalization, popular culture, glorifying the drug and things like that. Now, nothing had changed about the drug itself. It was the perception of the user that had changed, and it shows how quickly social change can come uh, if we want it to be that way. So very significant differences in our, our assumptions about what to do. Now, today, if we look at, at drug, uh, drug policy and how we wage the war on drugs, um, you know, what are the assumptions that go into that? Well, you know, I think the racial dynamics come from two sorts of sets of decisions. First, you know, enforcing drug laws is a very discretionary process, unlike crimes like murder, rape, robbery, where we may talk about long-term solutions, but in the short run, we need to have a quick response uh, when those crimes have been committed. Drug law enforcement is very discretionary. You know, where police will do their patrolling, do you go after so-called drug kingpins, do you go after kids on the street corner selling drugs, uh, to what extent do you make arrests, all those kinds of things. So we have 
lots of decisions being made, uh, and how we make those decisions determines a lot of the outcomes. Um, secondly, we have, it's not really a war on drugs, but I think we have sort of two wars on drugs or a sort of two-tiered approach. Uh, we have one very good model, and that model is the one we generally use in middle-class communities, communities with resources. Um, you know, lots of parents in suburban neighborhoods find out one day that their kid has a drug problem. And when they find that out, they don't usually call up the police and say, would you please arrest my son or daughter and give him one of those mandatory sentences, and that will deter him from further drug use, right? So they call up their friends who are social workers, and they get their kid into the best treatment program they can find. And if the first treatment program doesn't work, they try another one, and they throw money at problems, right? And usually that's successful after a while. So it is a good strategy. When it's low-income communities we're talking about, we don't have those same resources available. And so as we just heard this morning, then we can throw criminal justice resources at them in the form of police, prosecutors, prisons, and that becomes the solution. So same problem, two very different approaches depending on where we're looking. Um, we see in the whole area of sentencing policy the, the racial assumptions that go into it, or if we want to think of it as the, you know, the, the lack of racial consideration, as we develop sentencing policies that are supposedly race-neutral sentencing policy, and we never ask any questions about what the intended or unintended impact may be. Uh, so, you know, again, in the drug area, the most egregious of these are the federal crack cocaine sensing laws starting in 1986, uh, passed through Congress in record time, virtually no discussion, no, um, uh, unlike what Lisa's talking about, this wasn't where they consulted only with a certain set of experts, they didn't consult with anybody about this stuff because there was this political imperative to get this through. Uh, and lo and behold, 20 years later, now we know more than 80% of the people prosecuted for these offenses are African American, a combined effect of law enforcement and the sensing policies. Uh, we see it as well in uh, laws that many states have, what are called these school zone drug laws. Um, these are laws that penalize drug transactions usually within 500 feet or 1,000 feet of a school zone. And, you know, the, the basic idea behind this is, is supposedly, well, we don't want drug dealers selling drugs to our kids on the playground at lunchtime. It's hard to object to that, but, you know, there already are laws that prohibit that. We didn't need school zone drug laws to do that. But many of the school zone drug laws uh, don't restrict themselves to cases like that, but they also apply some cases to a drug transaction between consenting adults at three in the morning that happens to be right next to the schoolyard, and you can be charged for that as well. Now, why do these laws have a racial effect? Well, once you define it by a certain number of feet from a school, if you think about it, urban areas are much more likely to be subject to these school zone drug uh, felonies because they're much more densely populated. Many more people live or go by a school area than in rural or suburban areas. On top of that, communities of color are more likely to be in urban areas, so more likely to be affected by these laws as well. Um, the state of Illinois had a uh, school zone drug law that applied to juvenile cases. If a juvenile was charged with a school zone uh, offense, then he or she was automatically waived into adult court if, if it was near a school zone. Uh, so a few years ago, a study was done of cases where juveniles were waived to adult court in one year. There were 399 cases of kids waived to adult court. Of the 399, 396, 99% were black or Latino. The only interesting thing is how did the three white kids, you know, escape the guise of the prosecutor and not and slip into this? But 99%. So, you know, nothing in the law had a stated intent of harming kids of color, but clearly anyone could have predicted that in advance. Um, I think we see race-neutral effects, supposedly, uh, taking place in other sensing policies. Policies like three strikes and you're out laws, habitual offender laws, laws that are premised on giving harsher punishments to people with a prior record. Now, why does this make a difference? Well, when a person of color is coming to the court before, for sentencing, he or she is more likely to have a criminal record than a white person. Now, why is that? Well, some people may think there's more criminal involvement. Some people may think there's greater chance of arrest and 
charging by the police, whatever the case is, uh, the fact is people of color accumulate a criminal record much more readily. And so when they come to court and their sentence is going to be based on their prior record, they're much more likely to be uh, harmed by those policies. So in California, the figures I looked at several years ago, uh, about 31% of the people serving a felony conviction in a prison were African American, but when it came to a three strikes conviction, the figure was 43% were African American. Now, habitual offender laws, prior records, this has always been a consideration in courts for a long time, but now with the advent of laws like uh, three strikes where you can get 25 to life for a low-level property offense, uh, the magnitude of the difference is much more substantial and, and much more in terms of what we see as the effect. And we see it as well, I think, it gets in this whole policy of our, you know, it's not only the, the sentencing policies, but the sentencing severity overall. Uh, criminologist Ted Chiricos uh, has done some survey research, basically looks at to the extent that uh, there's a perception that a certain crime is a so-called black crime, one that blacks are most likely to commit. To the extent that that is the perception, then among whites, there's a much more severe response in terms of what the proposed punishment should look like. And there's no reason to believe that white policymakers are any different than the white public in terms of how they think about severity issues and things like that. So we see a whole range of ways in which, you know, sensing policies develop law enforcement based on these perceptions. Uh, we also see, it seems to me, that in terms of how we allocate resources, similar kinds of uh, developments as well. Uh, where we put our, our money in terms of criminal justice issues, uh, certainly when it comes to indigent defense, uh, just indigent defense in a horrendous uh, state in many, many parts of the country, uh, never adequately funded, uh, so people of color are much less likely to get a reasonable defense because they're more likely to be indigent. Uh, access to alternatives, incarceration, drug treatment programs, all sorts of things, you know, if you've got resources, you're much more likely to be able to have access there. Uh, the war on drugs overall, federal funding in the last 25 years through both Democratic and Republican administrations, two-thirds of federal funds go to law enforcement incarceration, one-third to prevention and treatment. I mean, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, certainly, uh, another element of all this is just the media imagery about crime and uh, who are the so-called criminals and what comes across, whether it's the 11 o'clock news, the cop shows on TV, and the like. We could, we could talk a lot about that. Um, the... To take a broader look as well, um, you know, we, we're very isolated in the U.S., of course, because we don't like to know what goes on in the rest of the world, but every once in a while it might not be a bad idea. And the little bit of comparative research that's been done looking at, um, you know, what do sentencing practices and policies look like shows that we are more severe on average. Uh, the average burglar in the U.S. Uh, will go to prison for twice as long as the average burglar in England and three times as long as the average burglar in Canada. Now, is there a magical amount of time that uh, makes sense for a person to go to prison for burglary? No, these are sort of culturally developed patterns and ideas and uh, hard to articulate by judges or legislators, but clearly, you know, other industrialized nations, for whatever set of reasons, have come to a different set of assumptions about this. Um, there are a couple of British criminologists who sort of look at different rates of incarceration and, and trying to explain why do some nations lock up their citizens at much greater rates than other nations. And they sort of see a correlation with uh, disparity of wealth in a society being correlated with higher rates of incarceration. And their idea is essentially that in societies where the rewards are, are so vastly different that the rewards at the top are very great, but so are the negative consequences at the bottom, uh, similarly very extreme too. Uh, and, and if you think about that in a sort of practical sense, how does that play out? Um, you know, in a society like the U.S., where despite, you know, much progress, you know, we still have a great degree of residential segregation, educational segregation, other ways. 
that here we have judges and legislators making decisions about sentencing policy, who, uh, what the consequence of committing crime should be, whether people should go to prison and the like. Uh, you know, if you're a sentencing judge, uh, that's uh, a very serious job to have. You have to make very difficult decisions, the most difficult of which, and any judge will tell you, is decision to send somebody to prison, and if so, for how long. You know, we are taking away a person's liberty for a period of time, their connections with the community, and one would hope they would view that as a profound decision every time they make it. Well, when we have a society that's very stratified by race and class, then uh, a judge has defendants coming before him or her uh, who the judge may not feel much connection with, right? Uh, the judge doesn't live in the same community as these people necessarily, doesn't know their family and relatives, doesn't have as much of a sense of who they are, and so it seems like we've got two different worlds in many ways. And if we're talking about putting someone in a cage, and that's what we're doing in a prison, right? It's much easier to put someone in a cage if you don't feel much connection with them, if you don't feel that, you know, the humanity they bring, if you don't think about the impact on their children, their community, and the like. So it becomes much easier to make those kinds of decisions. Um, let me just close with one last image. Um, and there was a period in the early 90s or so when some high-profile uh, right-wing commentators came up with this terminology of super predators. Many of you may remember that. Uh, John DiUlio, uh, William Bennett, and, and their buddies. Uh, and this was frequently displayed on the op-ed pages of the Wall Street Journal like. And super predators, they were talking about this new coming generation of young kids who are going to be, you know, more violent, more dangerous, more out of control than any generation we'd ever seen before. And they talked about this coming crime wave, and they basically said, America, you better get ready for this. We're in big trouble now. And they got a lot of attention for this. Well, a couple of things happened. One, uh, you know, almost uh, 20 minutes after they started doing this, again, all this tension, crime rates started to decline across the country, and more so among juveniles and more so among black children juveniles. Uh, and there was no question, even though they didn't articulate it, they were talking about, about black juveniles. So they were clearly wrong on the criminology part of it. But, you know, let's imagine for a moment that um, we actually thought we had this cohort of, let's say, five-year-old boys, is what they're talking about, who in 10 years or so were going to represent this potential crime wave. Now, what would we do as a society if we thought this was coming? Well, it seems to me we have two choices. One is we could start to build prisons as quickly as possible so we'd have enough places to put these kids once they turn 15 or 16 or so. That would be one strategy. The other strategy would be, you know, if we actually cared about these kids, cared about their families, cared about the communities, we would do exactly what we would do if they were our children and kids that we cared about. And we would say, we have a 10-year window of opportunity. What sorts of family and community supports can we provide? Can we provide uh, incentives for in this 10-year window of opportunity so that we reduce the scale of the problem we're talking about so we give families the capacity to deal with the problems that they're facing. And it seems to me if it's people we know about, we care about, then the decision is a no-brainer about which method we choose. When it's other people, kids, when it's racially defined problems, then society takes a very different approach. So I would hope we can get to a point where we start to build a sense of society where we can create that sense of community. Once we do that, then criminal justice starts to fade in the distance and we have a very different approach. Thank you very much. Thank you.